Hi, we're in Missouri this week and it's a jungle out there, so please bear with whatever strange noises you hear in the background. Now what we're talking about today is a comparison of two handguns, the Palmetto State Armory PSA 5.7 Rock in caliber 5.7 by 28 and the Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0 in caliber 5.7 by 28 comes with two very important caveats. One, we are not going to discuss and demonstrate disassembly and reassembly. It's tedious and it really is pretty simple and straightforward with both of these handguns. Two, today's presentation is not a discussion on the merits of caliber 5.7 by 28. We have several presentations on that. We're just comparing these two handguns. So with that, let's take a look. Now the Smith & Wesson comes in this nice rigid box. You open this up, and it's got this eggshell mattress kind of material. Behind here is your manual and your trigger lock. The pistol comes with two 22-shot magazines and this magazine loader. Now the way this works, put that over there and it's got a hole in the back of this. You just drop the round in and then push it in the magazine. Pretty easy to use. Magazine loaders like this can be really good for people with poor hand strength or arthritis or something like that. For most of us, they're not really necessary. However, the magazines that came with this particular Smith & Wesson have very stiff springs and they are among the extremely few magazines that I've ever encountered that I really needed to use the magazine loader to get them fully loaded. Now the pistol itself is a striker action and it's got the little button lever on the trigger that acts as a safety, very similar to a Glock. Now this particular one also has an ambidextrous thumb safety. And according to the sources I've looked at, you can also get this without thumb safety, at least according to the sources I've seen. Now again, two 22 shot magazines. It's got a rail system. It's got the white dot sights that are adjustable for windage by using an Allen wrench, but not adjustable for elevation. And the barrel is threaded for a suppressor. Now, if we look at our PSA, one, it comes in this bag, but the bag has a semi-rigid frame to it. We open this bag up and we see that here we have our manual right up here. The pistol is held securely in here. It's got a mag pouch that holds two magazines. Now it comes with two 23 shot magazines. And your trigger lock is here in what looks more like another mag pouch. So it's held more securely than the way Smith & Wesson does it. And aside from just a shipping box, this can be a range bag as well. Now if we take our pistol out, we see that it's also a striker action. It also has the sights that are adjustable for windage by using an Allen screw but not adjustable for elevation. It does not have a manual safety. It comes with two 23-shot magazines, has a rail system, and it's threaded for a suppressor. So in many ways, the two pistols are quite similar. Now you'll see this one is green. It does come in black. I got it in green just for fashion purposes. And so that you, the audience, when you see me shooting them, it'll be easier for you to tell which one I'm shooting. Now we have to take a moment to discuss what I'm going to call the politics of these two firearms in at least one specific way. I went to Garner's in Pendleton, Oregon, asked them to order me this Smith & Wesson M&P, which they did. Here it is. Great. I said, can you order me this PSA? And they told me, no, because they don't like doing business with PSA. Why? Now, if I understood him correctly, the way they explained it was that most gun companies will sell to local dealers at a wholesale rate, which the local dealer then adds money to, and that's his profit margin. Buy it wholesale, sell it retail. And according to the people at Garner's, PSA won't do that. He can't buy it for any lower price than what I would buy it for if I ordered it from PSA. So the way PSA does business is you order it from them, they ship it to your local gun dealer, and he then charges you a transfer fee, but that's not the same as buying it wholesale and selling it retail. Now you might think that that's really great because it cuts out the middleman and might save you some money. Yeah, but what it also does is undercut our local dealers and we really need our local dealers for all of those other things besides just ordering guns. And 
For me, it didn't really make much difference because these are just going to be used for today's demonstration. But if it's a gun that I'm really planning on keeping and using, then I want to be able to look at it, examine it, see how it works before I buy the thing, which I can do at a local dealer's shop and I can't do online. So I ended up having to go to Lincoln City Sporting Goods and they were okay with ordering it for me. But still, keep that in mind that that's the way it appears that PSA does business. Okay, all those things having been said and neat boxes aside, the proof of the firearm is in the shooting. So, let's go to the target. I have two shoot and see targets set up and I'll shoot these from 20 yards and I'll shoot the target on your left with the PSA, the target on your right with the M&P, and we'll start with the PSA. Now this is me shooting offhand from 20 yards, and this group can be covered with one hand, but that's still what I'd call a mediocre group. Why? We'll come back to that in a minute, but for right now, let's go back 20 yards and shoot the target on the right with the Smith & Wesson and see how the groups compare. And here we see, again, we can cover it with one hand, but it's still a mediocre group. So we see with the Smith & Wesson we're hitting fairly centered, that's okay. With the PSA we're hitting a little high, not great because we can't adjust those sights for elevation. So you're either going to have to just know that it hits high and compensate for it, or try some different types of ammo and see if you can shift that aiming point. But why are we getting mediocre groups? The first thing is we have to remember that we are not evaluating the accuracy of the firearm as much as the accuracy that can be achieved with this firearm by the average shooter. And the problem I'm having here is these sights are black and trying to see the black sights on the black target makes it difficult. And these white dots do not help. What I would typically do with a pistol like this is black out those white dots and that's going to make it easier for me to see the top of the front sight and the top of the rear sight. So, let's black out these dots, put up a different target, and see if we can improve these groups. Now I've put up a different shoot and see with a much bigger orange center, so my sights will be on the orange, not on the black. And I've blacked out those white dots. So now I'll shoot this with the PSA from 20 yards, and let's see if we can improve my group. couple of modifications and our group gets a whole lot better. Now I've put up a new shoot and see, blacked out the sights on my M&P, let's shoot this from 20 yards and see if I can improve my group.
And we have a decent group with a few flyers, which really are just me. So although some people would say that's a good group, I'm going to still call it mediocre. And switching to a different target didn't really help us out very much with the M&P. Now there's something that should not need to be part of today's presentation, but I know people are going to discuss it, so we're going to include it. And that's the difference between a 22 shot magazine and a 23 shot magazine. Now I've got our favorite target soda jugs, and I'm going to go back a few yards and I'll engage the jug on your left with the Smith & Wesson M&P and its 22 shot magazine, and then I'll engage the jug on your right with the PSA and its 23 shot magazine, and let's see if there's a difference. Wow, I'm really lucky that this PSA had a 23-shot magazine, not just a 22. That saved my bacon. Now, a couple of things to add. First, neither of these handguns has a magazine safety. With the magazine out, both of them will fire. Secondly, specific to the Smith & Wesson, when I put this 22-shot magazine into the pistol, sometimes it has a little trouble locking up, especially when I had it fully loaded with 22 rounds found out that I had to lock the slide back, then put the magazine in, and then let the slide go forward. And that's something you can do, but I consider that to be kind of bothersome when it comes to a handgun. Now what are the takeaways from all of this here today? Okay, first we have to discuss that nonsensical 23 versus 22 shot magazine drill. Now the thing is, in comparing these two handguns and people discussing which one they think would be the better one to buy, there's a bunch of things to take into consideration. Which one fits your hand? Which one fits your budget? Which one is more reliable? Which one can you shoot more accurately? And so forth. Magazine capacity is an important part of most discussions. If you were looking at two 1911 platforms in caliber 45 ACP, and this one was available with a seven shot mag, and that one had an eight shot mag, discussing whether or not eight over seven would really get you an advantage, that's worthy of discussion. Comparing these two and making the assertion that because this has a 23-shot magazine it has any kind of advantage over one with a 22-shot magazine is kind of silly. That would be a distant, distant last thing to talk about as compared to other things like accuracy and reliability. And speaking of those, when it comes to reliability, today I had zero malfunctions with the PSA. I had three malfunctions with the Smith & Wesson. And we don't want to judge all Smith & Wessons by the results that I get here today with this one, but still, that's bothersome. We also saw that I could shoot the PSA more accurately than I could shoot the Smith & Wesson. And it does just fit my hand better. Now, the Smith & Wesson has the manual safety. And some people consider that a big advantage. And according to the sources I've seen, I think the Smith & Wesson is available without the manual safety. So if you don't like it, there is that. However, the PSA has, of course, that little lever on the trigger like a Glock. But what it also has is a very stiff trigger pull. Once I take out that little bit of slop, it really takes some effort to pull that trigger. It's not one that's likely going to go off accidentally. I really got to put some effort into it to pull that. And that will be an advantage that will keep a lot of people from having a negligent discharge. So we see that comparing these two guns, for me, PSA seemed more reliable. I could shoot it more accurately. I even liked the green color. And I really like the packaging of the PSA over the Smith & Wesson. And last but not least, I really need this Hokie magazine loader to load the Smith & Wesson's magazines, while I didn't need that for the PSA. So the real bottom line is, which of these pistols is right for me? The PSA is the clear winner. Which one is right for you? Only you can be the judge. So as always, don't try this at home on what you call a professional, and thanks for watching the PSA versus M&P video.